So it's my great privilege to welcome you to Redeemer Downtown. It's wonderful to be with you here uh, today. Kyoko and I wanted to thank you for your support and for your prayers during this season away from me. Uh, we appreciate it very, very much. Uh, we have been worshiping with you for the past months, uh, albeit from a distance online. And you'll be hearing a little bit more from me later, a little bit of an update on what's going on, uh, what's going to be going on with me. Music is a reminder that we worship a God of beauty and that we are marked as a people of beauty. And so as you listen to the prelude, take this time to prepare yourself for our worship. Welcome to Redeemer Downtown. It is just a pleasure to have you join us today. Let me prepare us for worship along these lines. Many of us are raising plants and gardens in our apartments or backyards if you have one, and they require a lot of attention. You have to water it every once in a while. You have to turn the plant around to every uh, which way so that each side gets sunlight. When the soil looks unhealthy, sometimes we have to add things to it or we have to replace the soil altogether. This is a process of cultivation. That's what we're doing. And that's what we're doing in the worship service as well. We are paying attention to the things in our life where uh, we need to be formed and not deformed. And so worship is one area of our life that we need to pay specific attention to. So today, throughout the worship service, as you sing songs, as you pray, as you hear God's message, and as you respond to him, Please know that that is what's going on. You are cultivating your life in such a way that it is good for you and for your heart and for your soul because we need to experience God and the Son. So if you're ready to experience that, you're in the right place, you click the right link, welcome to worship, let's stand or take any posture of worship that's comfortable for you for our first song. Thank you. 
Please join me now in the call to worship. Praise be to you, O Lord, God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you, you are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we delight and rejoice to be in your house and in your presence today. We're so grateful that you would choose to be accessible, although you are a king. And although you are holy and we are not, you condescended to our level so that you might be known and that we would experience you in your fullness. And a part of that fullness is your grace and mercy. Thank you that you have unfailing love and great compassion for us as your children who have lived in unrighteous ways. In so many ways, we have profaned your name and have been poor representatives of who you are to our world. And yet you're a God who has loved us all throughout. Your love is shown in the giving of your son, Jesus, who became our elder brother so that we might be saved. He's our perfect savior who is treated as we should have been treated and therefore purchased our adoption when we were orphans in the world. We thank you because you do not leave us as we are and you continue to walk with us by your spirit. We pray this in the name of the one, Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, to no surprise, during this time of shelter in place and during the season where we're just stuck at home, I've been eating a lot, and that also means that I've been eating a lot of sweets, and I therefore developed two cavities, according to my dentist. Uh, the, the first cavity is a really bad one that's stuck in the back. The dentist said that this filling is going to be extremely painful, and it was, and so I had to get injected with anesthesia, not once, but twice. And even with that, it wasn't enough. Uh, as they were filling it, it just hurt so much. My nerves were firing. 
On the other hand, there was a, a second cavity, which is to the back right, and this one was a lot smaller. Uh, the dentist said that it isn't going to hurt, barely, if anything. So, yeah, and that was, the, that was the reality. It didn't hurt that much because they got to it early on. This time of confession every week in our worship service, hopefully, is the latter, the second cavity, where we're addressing the sins in our lives before it gets damaging like the first cavity. We're hopefully getting to it before the sins become critical and, and so uh, severely damaging to our lives. And that's what we're doing through this prayer of confession and also in the silent confession that we'll partake in together. So please join me now in this prayer. O oh Lord, you are our Father, and we are but earth and mire. You are our creator, and we are the work of your hands. You are our shepherd, and we are your flock. You are our redeemer, and we are the people you have bought back. You are our God, and we are your inheritance. Therefore, do not be angry against us to corrupt us in your wrath. Do not recall our sin to punish it but chastise us gently in your kindness. Be mindful that your name is upon us, that we bear your mark and badge. Undertake the work you have already begun in us by your grace, that the whole earth may recognize that you are our God and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take this time now in silence to make this prayer your own? Wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse? For my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking.
Now hear these words of pardon for all those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. This is the good news. Thanks be to God. Just two announcements before the passing of the peace. First, today at three different locations, three different parks all over the city, we will be partaking in communion with all the CDC guidelines. Jeff, David, and I will be at these parks uh, separately at Battery Park, Washington Square Park, and Prospect Park. At this point, I believe that all the spots are filled, but just check anyway. There's a link that should be on the screen right now. Uh, but if not, we will have this uh, on a routinely basis every other week for the month of September and October. So please continue to check in and please reserve your spot as they will fill up. Also, our diaconate will be available at these parks and ready and willing to pray with you and for you. Finally, this Wednesday at 8 p.m. over Zoom, we will have a church-wide virtual town hall meeting where we'll be updating you on our uh, church, our, our focuses, our ministry year, and we hope that we will see all of your faces on the screen as we interact with you, as you share your thoughts with us, and as we embark on this year together. And that uh, registration link is also on the screen. And now the passing of the peace is a time in our service where we are not just greeting one another, but we are exchanging blessing. We are blessing one another, so please do that through text, through email, with the people in your life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. be with you. If you have a chance, please reach out to somebody today to extend the peace of Christ. Today's scripture reading comes from Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 8. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid, for the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away a strong nation, the Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship will come to daughter Jerusalem. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today in great need, in need of your presence, in need of your word, in need of your guidance and direction over us, our church, and our city. We pray that to that end you would meet with us, that you would speak to us through your word, through the prophet Micah. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, uh, I can't believe it myself, but it is already the middle of September, and we're entering into this fall. And the fall typically for me is my favorite time of the year. It's the time when weather starts to get cold and crisp, and you can wear a sweater, and it's a time for new beginnings. Right? The new ministry year typically t- uh, kicks off, the new school year, and people are starting work for the first time. We've come back from break, and now we are typically ready to go, but this time it feels different because things have changed. I mean, collectively, when I just think about what we have all endured and gone through over the past several months, man, it's a lot, and it's quite overwhelming. And I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like I'm still processing what has happened and what is happening, and it makes me not ready to move on and look forward to what's about to happen. I think that as a church, as well as as a city, we're entering into the fall with the most uncertainty that we have faced in quite a long time. Because all of our plans have been thwarted, haven't they? We're all asking the question, therefore, man, where is it that we are going? I feel like that's the question in my heart, and maybe that's the question in your heart. Where are we going as a church? Where are we going as a city? Where are we going just as Christians? And it does feel like we are desperate for just some stability, for some certainty and some direction as we look out into the unknown, into the abyss of all that is going to be this fall and all uh, that's going to be happening in our world. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel lost today. Maybe you feel anxious. Maybe you are unnerved for a whole host of different reasons. And maybe that's causing you to want to just disengage and claim 2020 as the victor. You don't want to engage with 2020 any longer because it has thrown us some heavy blows up to this point. But here's the thing. See, as uncertain and as unstable as we may feel, we've got to remember that from God's perspective, nothing has changed. From God's perspective, he still sits on his throne. From God's perspective, nothing has caught him off guard. And 2020 has not thwarted his plans. And in fact, If we believe his word to be true, he tells us that we are called to be exactly where we are as he is moving redemptive history forward. And he has promised that where he is taking us and how he is taking us is better than any way that we could possibly do it ourselves. But of course, we quite often lose sight of that, as often God's people do frequently. And the sad news is, is when we do, our lives begin to not reflect the ways uh, in which God gives us the hope to live today. We don't reflect God's future reality, and we don't live the way that he calls us to. And it's to that very point that the prophet Micah speaks to us today. We're beginning a, a new sermon series this fall through the prophet Micah and some other prophetic passages in the Old Testament that is meant to anchor us and give us direction in a time of uncertainty and in a time of just utter confusion. And the theme passage that we have read today from Micah 4 gives us this description of exactly that, right? It's this wonderful vision of a world that is to come, that is far off in the distance, yet we can get a glimpse of it. And we are called, Micah calls us, to live out that future in the here and now. This beautiful world that he gives us a glimpse of is depicted as the, as the mountain of the Lord, and it is at the same time, totally in, uh, out of harmony with the reality of our world and what we experience, and yet fully in harmony with what we hope and want the world to be, a world that is so upright and true, a world that is so secure, a world that is full of justice and peace and true shalom and true abundance and flourishing, a world where all the nations will flow to this great mountain, And as we look at that, the prophet Micah is is wanting us to have that as the compass for our lives for Christians in a changing world. A true north, in a sense, that anchors us, that orients us, and moves us closer and closer toward him so that we may walk in the name of the Lord our God. And that's exactly what Micah says and calls us to do in verse 5. He says, all the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. No matter what is happening around us, through us, in our community, or in our city. That's the hope for our church. 
this fall, and that's always been the hope for our church for the days to come as well, that we would walk in the name of the Lord our God and therefore serve as this beautiful foretaste of this mountain of the Lord, a foretaste of the future that is to come. And so this fall, we're going to be looking week by week at different aspects of God's heavenly future that we're called to live out today. But today, I want to just give us uh, two themes that I hope we will hold on to throughout this entire fall, two themes that we need as we journey ahead in faith. And that's this, that the mountain of the Lord gives us what we need today, and it also keeps us trusting in Him for tomorrow. The mountain of the Lord gives us what we need today, and it keeps us trusting in Him for our tomorrow. So let's look at that today. First, the mountain of the Lord, as Micah points out, gives us what we need uh, for today. Now, when you just uh, think about the mountains in the Bible and uh, some of the deep theological richness that not only the Bible talks about, uh, about mountains, but also just in the ancient Near East, right? Mountains served great purposes. And one of the ways, one of the theological reasons uh, and the ways in which this served was to comfort and to give direction to God's people. And I see that uh, in a couple of ways in our text as well. See, the mountain of the Lord that we see here in our text, I mean, you can't help but get this sense of this huge grandness, bigger and higher than anything, up into the clouds to the point where it trumps any other mountain and hill in its sight. And it is so big that it makes you feel like nothing smaller than it could ever move it nor destroy it. And that's actually one of the metaphors that the Bible gives to us uh, of the mountain of the Lord. And it's to show that God has victory over chaos, has victory over anything else that is smaller than him in and of this world. And so you can imagine how this vision was meant to function for God's people as they pictured that. Right? It's this picture of a mountain so big, so utterly attractive that it starts to overtake your vision. And as you fix your eyes upon that, upon the mountain of the Lord, everything else becomes smaller in your life. Everything else becomes small to the point where you recognize that God's reality is true reality. That all will be shaken, will be shaken, and only the eternal will stand that he is greater than any chaos that we are bound to face. And so that's one of the deep theological reasons why uh, we are given all that we need today. And that's that we have this deep comfort in the midst of chaos. But also, mountains, as we see throughout the Bible, were the place, uh, was the place where God met with his people, where his special presence dwelt. Right, we see that in the book of Exodus when uh, Moses goes up to the top of Mount Sinai to receive the law uh, from God. But that's also the place where uh, Moses comes to meet face to face with the Lord. We also see uh, Jesus in his transfiguration uh, happens at the top of a high mountain place. And so again, biblically, when you look at mountains for God's people, so long as you could see the mountain of the Lord, you were assured that his presence was there with you. And then thirdly, as we look at this big picture in Micah 4, not only does it show this grandness and stability that gives us comfort, but this mountain also shows us his character, what he is all about. Not only his character, but also the, coming, uh, the character of his coming kingdom. And that serves a purpose, so that, and it's so that we might live out that character today and bear his actual name. Uh, Ali Henney, she's a contributor for the Witness BCC. She tweeted something out last week that was uh, sent around by a number of people. And she says this. She said, justice requires us to use our imaginations to envision a world that does not yet exist while contending for the tools to build what we see in the here and now. You see, that is what the mountain of the Lord does for the Christian. It shapes us and it orients our walks in the here and now giving us the vision, the vision to build and walk toward God's future. See, others in this world are grasping for ideas of peace and shalom and flourishing, and they have half-hearted ideas of it. But yet for the Christian who settles on the mountain of the Lord, we know what that looks like, and we know what it is that we are striving for. So when you put those things together, you can start to see how the mountain of the Lord gives us what we need for today, no matter what our circumstances might be, right? Because he gives us a sense of his sovereignty and his rule over the chaos of our lives to keep us anchored. 
He gives us a deep sense of his presence, his leading, and his guidance as our good shepherd to comfort us in the midst of our lives. And he also gives us a picture of his character that sparks our imaginations to envision a world that does not yet exist so that we can start building some of it today in the here and now. And that's what gives us a sense of direction in this life. So when you think about the mountain of the Lord, this is a deeply comforting picture in a time such as this. But this also keeps us to trust in him for our tomorrow. Not just giving us what we need for today, but it keeps us trusting in him for our tomorrow. Because there will inevitably be a wall that we are going to hit as we strive to be a foretaste of that beautiful coming kingdom. And what is that wall? It's that it does not come soon enough. Now, maybe you've hit that wall. Maybe you've already gotten to the point of your frustration with Christianity as a whole because you're not seeing enough of that fruit, enough of the mountain of the Lord present here today. That's why we have to see these really important words in the beginning of our passage in verse 1. And of course, it says, in the last days, right? This vision of the mountain of the Lord is not imminent. It is not an earthly vision, but instead it is a picture of the end of history when Christ will come again to fully inaugurate his rule and his kingdom. And what that means for us is that it should serve as a reminder that Christians are inherently an in-between people of God. Christians, therefore, are truly in it for the long run because we know that nothing that we do in the here and now can ever fully bring about this beautiful world that we long for, that causes us to endure, to be patient, and to trust and hope in him. And every other picture of the world that tries to bring about that beautiful kingdom in the here and now is utter idolatry. David Coises, he wrote this book uh, called uh, Political Visions and Illusions. It's a great book. And in it, he breaks down how every human ideology tends to take or, or absolutely takes a good thing in God's creation and makes it a God, deifies it a God so that they can have what they're wanting, longing for in the here and now. And he says how all of those things utterly fail because it is idolatry. Because what we read here in this passage is that there is no earthly kingdom, there is no political party, and there is no earthly ideology that will bring about God's future kingdom today. Meaning this, that anyone who thinks that they can accomplish this future world fully in the here and now is not walking in the name of the Lord our God. Plain and simple. And I know that that is a touchy subject. That's a touchy point uh, to make right now because we are clearly in a cultural moment where change is being demanded and it is clearly needed. Hear me say that. Change is being demanded and it is absolutely needed. But what David Coises is trying to remind us of is, our, uh, is of our idolatrous hearts that has the propensity to always take good things that the Lord has given us and to turn them into ultimate things. And of course, God, he calls that idolatry. Why? Because Christians are called to live in this tension that requires patience. A tension where we must trust in the Lord for our tomorrow and his plans for his creation. Without taking his place, trusting that he will bring this about. Trusting and hoping that this will be true because he will do it. Tish Warren in her book, uh, Liturgy of the Ordinary, again an another great book, she says this. The singular mark of patience is not endurance or fortitude, but hope. To be impatient is to live without hope. Patience is grounded in the resurrection. It is life-oriented toward a future that is God's doing. And it's a sign, uh, and its sign is longing, not so much to be released from the ills of the present, but in anticipation of the good to come. I love that. And what this does is that it keeps us trusting in him for our tomorrow, looking to him and him alone as the one who can bring about the good for his creation. 
And I think this can be such a unique way in which Christians can walk in the name of the Lord our God, bearing his mark as we grow in patience, living in this tension well, growing in our long suffering, not only as we hold out hope for the world that is to come, but as we actively walk to bear witness to his character of justice, peace, full flourishing in shalom that we'll be looking at throughout this fall. If we do that, and that is what we're called to do, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God. But how? Right? Lastly, how is it that we know that this future vision will fully come to pass? And I think that is the key question to ask. And to answer that, we have to look back to another mountain. Not a mountain that is to come that we're putting all of our hope and faith into, but one that's already passed, one that we can bank on, one that we have already seen and experienced. And this mountain is not the biggest mountain in the world like this Mount Zion that we see. It's not the most upright. It's not full of, uh, of peace. But instead, it's a tiny hill, one that goes unseen. And it's not a place of shalom, but it's a place of brokenness and darkness. And of course, that's Mount Calvary, the place of the skulls, the very place where Jesus, where Jesus was crucified on a hill outside the city gates. See, looking at Mount Calvary is how we know that we as God's people will make it, surely make it to Mount Zion. Because that, my friends, is the mountain that proves to us and to the world that God is not content to leave us as we are in our, in our confusion, in our brokenness, in our idolatry, and in our sin. But instead, it's a mountain that shows us that he acts, that he cares. It's a mountain that proves to us John three sixteen and 17, where we read, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That is the place where he goes to great lengths to redeem his people, to secure our lot. That is the place where Jesus' death and resurrection begins a new creation that we are now called to participate in, one that will last forever and ever, one that will reconcile not only mankind to one another, but mankind to a holy and just God. And these are the things that we must keep in mind as we journey ahead, as we look at this, uh, as we look ahead at the world that God is moving us closer and closer to. Because see, friends, no matter how you're feeling, no matter how uh, unnerved and anxious you might be, the Lord has given us everything that we need for this journey that he has called us to. The journey that he has called us to both today as well as for tomorrow. And if we can just keep our eyes fixed on the mountain of the Lord, then we will walk in his name and bear witness to the world that needs this message. And as we stumble, as we are surely to do, as we uh, get knocked off of our path, as we surely will, as we bump into one another and scrape our knees and upset one another and offend one another, and as we don't live as that future hope calls us to live, our prayer is that we may encourage one another to just simply look up on this journey. Look up and see this mountain of the Lord for all that we need today as well as for all that we need tomorrow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that this vision is true and it is an amen in Jesus and in Jesus alone. And to that end, we pray that we would be a faithful community that walks in your name, that is enlivened by your spirit to walk differently from this world, knowing exactly where we are headed, comforted and secure in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The offering is a time for us to respond to this message. How lavishly he has given us to secure our future in him. And so with that heart, we give of all that we have. We give of our talents, we give of our time, and we also give of our gifts. And so as the musicians play, take some time now to reflect and to respond to this gospel message.
So I want to provide to you a little bit of an update uh, on where things are with me, and I wanted to thank you very much. Kilk and I thank you very much uh, for your support and your prayers uh, during this time that we've been away. I also want to thank you for the opportunity to serve you as Senior Minister of Redeemer Downtown. And I simply wanted to read to you a letter uh, that I had written. Uh, it's a letter to the church. Uh, it's a letter that many of you have already seen. Uh, but I wanted to read it to you uh, just to give you an update. Dear brothers and sisters, I hope that you and loved ones have been safe, particularly during this unique time in our city, our country, and our world. I recognize that this has been a difficult season for many of you, and please know that throughout this time I have prayed regularly for our congregation, staff, and city. Kyoko and I would like to extend our deepest gratitude to the congregation, staff, and officers of Redeemer Downtown during this period of rest for me and for our family. You have supported and cared for us in innumerable ways through cards, prayers, and gifts, our apologies uh, if we did not always reply. And at a time when we all have been stretched in unprecedented ways, it's because of your encouragement, support, and gift of time and space that my health has been restored. Uh, and I've been able to strengthen the bonds of family and even more to reconnect with God. Words simply cannot convey our sense of indebtedness for your gracious support and love. Over the past 18 months, and in a more focused manner since March, Kyoko and I have discussed at length my future as a senior pastor of Redeemer Downtown. This process has included hours of prayer, coaching, and counseling. I have been in regular conversation with the elders of Redeemer Downtown, with senior staff, with wise counselors and friends in ministry who know me and the Redeemer community. And while the current global pandemic and my recent diagnosis of clinical depression were factors in this process of discerning God's calling for me, they were only two of many, which include our own commitment to New York City, the Redeemer movement, and our wonderful congregation of Redeemer downtown, the areas of ministry that I believe God has granted to me, and the kingdom priorities of our family. Without a doubt, Redeemer has transformed our lives. We would not still be in New York City, nor would we have understood God's kingdom purposes and the transformative power of the gospel apart from it. It is a truly special place with a vision for New York City that is full of beauty and self-giving love and hope. I consider it the singular highlight of my professional career to have been part of this story in a formal capacity, beginning first as a fellowship group director 19 years ago, and as the lead and most recently as a senior pastor of Redeemer Downtown for almost eight years. It has been a humbling privilege to have played a role in launching and shepherding Redeemer Downtown in its earliest years. It is with personal sadness and yet with profound hope that I will be stepping down as senior pastor of Redeemer Downtown this fall. This is a decision that was not made lightly, and yet it is one that I believe will be vital to my family's health and also to the thriving of Redeemer Downtown. Our family will continue to play a role in the life of Redeemer Downtown, whether in a formal or informal capacity. Kyoko and I want to be a part of Redeemer's future, and particularly that of Redeemer Downtown, as it continues to serve our city for its joy, peace, and flourishing. New York City needs Redeemer downtown more so than ever, as do I and the rest of my family. We need to be a thriving, life-giving church for the good of our city. And while the nature of my role will change, we look forward to continuing actively as worshipers, participants, and supporters of Redeemer downtown. We also look forward to encouraging current and future leaders who can provide the focus and the visionary shepherding that Redeemer Downtown needs to thrive during this next season and beyond. As for me, over the next few months, my plan is to continue to pray and to seek God to, as to how I can best be part of the Redeemer vision as a father, as a husband, uh, as a New Yorker, and as a worshiper of Jesus. For example, one passion that I've always had, which in fact is what brought me to Redeemer in the first place, is exploring how the gospel impacts skeptical global professionals in our increasingly secular, urban, and polemic world, and building relationships at a time when identity is at the forefront of our cultural thinking and public discourse. 
And while the season with me as senior pastor will come to a close, I am profoundly hopeful for Redeemer Downtown and its ongoing mission. Our moment in history requires leadership that is singularly focused, innovative, and hopeful about the city, which characterizes the staff with which I have been privileged to work and lead. And it also requires humility, courage, and hopefulness from a congregation that serves the city, one that I've had the joy and the honor of leading and shepherding. Redeemer Downtown has brought hope and beauty to my life as it continues to do for the city. It has been my sole aspiration to magnify Jesus and to preach him and him crucified, both in my words and in my life, in moments of strength, and even more so in moments of weakness. And to the extent that this has yielded fruit and hope in the life of Redeemer Downtown, I am profoundly grateful to God. Our family has no intention of leaving New York City. Uh, we plan to be deeply involved at Redeemer Downtown, a community which we simply love. And I hope to continue in friendship and fellowship and serving Jesus together with you for many years to come. I love you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to have served you. Thank you for all the ways that you have cared for me and served me and my family. Please pray for me as I will continue to pray for you. Ever yours in Christ, John. Please join me now for the prayers of the people. My name is Henry Wu, and I'm one of the elders at Redeemer Downtown. Please join me as we pray for our church, our city, and the world, and especially our dear brother in Christ, John Lin. Heavenly Father, we thank you that nearly 20 years ago, you called John to New York City to serve at Redeemer. We thank you that from that moment until today, he has served the church with unimpeachable character, conduct, and integrity. We thank you for his many years of faithful and winsome preaching of the gospel to a city full of skeptics. We thank you for his entrepreneurial spirit and the managerial gifts you've given him through which he has built the wonderful congregation and staff that is Redeemer Downtown. We thank you for his unwavering commitment to the health and flourishing of the church through every challenge we have faced. We thank you for his humility and courage, especially in the difficult decisions he has had to make in recent months. And we thank you for the great love you have shown him every day as a pastor at Redeemer and your grace in bringing him rest and healing over the past four months. And Father, as our dear brother John Lynn looks to the future, we claim your promise to prosper him and not to harm him, to give him hope and a future. Please guide his mind and his heart as he thinks and plans and explores and pursues. Give him ears to hear you, eyes to see you at work around him, and make him know your pleasure. Set your agenda before him, revealed in the light of your word and guided by the sweetness of your Holy Spirit. Please protect him from worry and enable him to consistently feel the consolation of your guiding hand. We ask that you would allow wisdom to meet opportunity in his life today and in the days to come. We pray your best for him, Lord that you would honor his service to our church family through the spiritual blessings that only you can bestow. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church, Redeemer Downtown. Thank you for John and all that he has done for our church since we started eight years ago. For the strong staff and community he has helped craft, which will help us navigate these turbulent times. And they are turbulent for our country and our city. Lord, we pray for Redeemer Downtown that we could be light in a city that is darkened. We pray for New York that you would help us to tame the coronavirus, bring order and safety to our streets, and reconcile us to each other across racial and class lines. We pray that schools, businesses, and cultural institutions would reopen and bring back the city we love. We pray for the people of our city who have been affected physically, mentally, and economically, that you would restore them. We pray you would use our church to be your hands and feet to help our city recover. 
Give us wisdom, resilience, and compassion to do so. And we trust that you will care for our church going forward and provide everything we need, including a new senior pastor. Lord, we rejoice in you and give thanks even in these trying circumstances. Sanctify us through and through. Amen. As God cleanses and renews our being, he gives us a new love and longing for our neighbors and friends to come to the knowledge of Christ. So please join me as we pray for all to know this wonderful Savior in the prayer of mission together. O oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and send your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for our worship service today. Uh, we do want to connect with you, and there's a special time to do that. Uh, we hope that you will join us at 11 a.m. today for our Sunday uh, conversation and coffee hour. It's a great time for congregants to connect with staff just to see how we are all doing. 
Secondly, we know that this is still a, a very difficult time for many of us, and so we would love to pray for you, to connect with you, uh, to see how we can provide community for you. And so on the next page during the post loop, you'll see a number of ways when you can, uh, how you can text us to connect with us uh, so that we can be the body that encourages one another during this season. Now, it is my honor to ask John to come up and to give us our benediction. Benediction is a good word. It's a reminder of who we are in Jesus, and it's also a reminder of what we are called to be and to do in the world. So receive now the benediction. And now may the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the undying love of God our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship and the life-giving presence of his Holy Spirit be with you all both now and forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth to serve the world as those who love our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Go in peace.